And you're showing me some things about outreach and dealing with a lot of people out there. So, and also, I, I challenge you this year to set a goal, whether say, hey, this year, I want to win 200 people to Christ, five people a month, because when you set that goal, you write the vision and you make it plain for he that sees it. You're going to run with that vision. You're going to see it. Yep, I need to get out here today. I tell my team, go out on purpose, intentionally. Go out to Walmart, go out to a store. Whether you need to buy anything or not, just go. And that was the one word God gave me when I, before I even came back from the river. And I asked him, Lord, what do you, it's so much. I learned so much. What do you want me to tell the people? I heard one word, go. Because, you know, that's the word. It's not an option. We have to go into the hedges and the highways and compel them to come. And I want to read this in the Amplified Classic. Then the master said to the servant, go, put into the hedges and urge and constrain them to yield and come in so that my house may be filled. You know, I love the way my, um, one of my professors says, she says, you know, they shove their stuff on us. <laughs> we can shove the gospel on them. <laughs> you know, constrain, force, means to force them to come. You know, Jehovah Witness don't have a problem trying to force religion. You know, in the school systems, they got all this stuff going on, gender and all this stuff, trying to force so it's time for us to force too. It's time for us to get busy for the Lord. And I want to rep bring out the team. We have James, Joe, Deidre, Johanna, Laney, Martha, and Randy and Susie couldn't be here today. Couldn't do this without my team. So I thank God for them. I thank God for, for the team. Because they are out there working with me. And we do have fun at times. I appreciate you guys. And one more person I want to thank is Pastor Bethany Morgan for putting these t-shirts together and designing the t-shirts. Thank you, Bethany. <laughs> and the videos. Praise the Lord. Let's give, let's give them another hand of appreciation. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you for your leadership, passion. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have, we have, we are, we're, we're focused on the harvest, what we call the American mission field. That's what Jeanette is focused on. Street Reach is focused on. And we, again, we, we encourage you to get involved. We have training. So we're not just going to put you out there and not, you don't know what to do. We're going to, we're going to train you. So um, we also have our focus on world missions. Uh, Doris Godley is headed to Dominican Republic next month. I'm looking for Doris. Hey, Doris, come up here. Let her just spend a minute here talk about her trip. Just come up here and share with us. We want to keep her in our, our prayers. And also, if you feel to support her, you're, we open that up as well. Ooh. We need a rail on that thing, don't we? Good morning. Praise the Lord. Um, First Chronicles 16, 24 said, Declare his glory to the nations. Make known his marvelous works among all people. So that's what I'm going to uh, do in Dominican Republic. I'm going to uh, declare his glory among his people. And I've gone on a medical missions trip with a friend of mine who invited me to come along with her and um, this will be my fourth missionary journey my first one was to Wulan's uh, beloved Liberia West Africa um, as a come and see missions trip my second mission trip was to Spain as a part of a Bible college I was attending that was a requirement that you go on at least one mission trip 
my third mission trip was with my former church to Guatemala. And so this will be my fourth missionary journey. And the first thing I would like to say, it's been too long because I've only done four trips in 30 years. But I've committed now, since I'm at a mission-minded church, that I will be going once a year now. So uh, uh, at Dominican Republic, as I said, it's a medical mission trip. So um, I'd just like for you to pray that our team will be mission-minded as well, that we will just win people to the Lord through letting the glorious light of the gospel shine through us. Pray for our safety as we travel about and also while we're working in the community. Help us to have compassion and resilience and work in unity. And we also want to pray for the sponsoring church because um, I, what I remember when I was in Guatemala, we attended the service after the last night. And the pastor was weeping because we had poured out all to the people. But that night, that Friday night, I guess they went out partying because they didn't show up at his church. So he was just crying and apologizing to us for all that we had poured into the people. So just pray for the sponsoring church that, you know, they will win souls after all the work that we do out there on the field. So. Praise the Lord. Yeah, help her. Wonderful. Amen. We do have, uh, we do have Cornerstone trips planned this year. Uh, Chris and Karen Culp will be leading a team to uh, the Philippines, then also uh, Uganda and Tanzania toward the end of the year. Pastor David is leading a team to India, uh, I think in November. Is that correct? And uh, so, if you, if you have in your heart to go somewhere, you can talk to these people and see how, how you might uh, be a part of that. Amen? Praise God. Uh, we're going to receive our, our tithes and offerings this morning. Our ushers are going to get ready to come. We are, we are uh, this year, this first of this year, we are, we've declared a fast. We've been fasting now for two weeks. Today is the 15th day. Somebody say Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One, one week to go. Now, many people have told me about their fast. Some people eating one meal a day. Some people just not eating anything. Uh, others are fast a few days, take some time off, fast again. So we just encourage you to again, if you've not fasted, if you've not fasted at all during this time, this is your week. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, you can fast all week. You can fast one day. You can fast one meal. Somebody say amen. And uh, so as we've been teaching, and if, you, if you've seen the Facebook Live broadcast we've done so far, they're, they're, they're on the site. They're, I think, even on YouTube. Go back there. Most of those are dealing with, with fasting. And, and uh, I find that when I'm fasting, if I'll study fasting, it helps me stay, helps me stay focused and motivated. And, uh, and so it's been good. We thank God for it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, uh, in, our, in our offering, I want to just spend just one minute talking about our vision for this, uh, for this church. I, I, I see that 2024 is a year of preparation. I believe that 2025 is going to be a year that we're going to build. Uh, we have plenty of room here to build. I see us building a, 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 a I, I, to the Lord, I call it a state-of-the-art facility out here out front. And uh, it'll be a 1,500-seater with uh, offices, classrooms, that kind of thing. So we're going we're gonna to prepare for that through this year. As some, for some of our visitors, in October of 22, we paid off this property. We, this property is totally paid off by God's grace. Praise the Lord. So 2024 is going to be your preparation. You know, we, you got it takes, it takes time to develop site plans and and plans get those approved at the at the city level and all that stuff but but that's 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 our focus and so what are we going to do we're going to pray one we're going to pray number two we're going to we're going to give we're going to pray about what god is going to have every person to do uh we have a building fund god's blessed our building fund we 
We are now, uh, I think, over 300000 in the building fund right now. But I, I personally would like to have a million dollars in that account before we start building. Uh, that's what I think. But as I'm fasting the last two weeks, uh, the Lord, you know, sometimes you fast a long time, you think you'd feel real spiritual. Sometimes you don't. <laughs> so it's a faith thing. Uh, but, but one thing the Lord spoke to me very clearly, God spoke to me and said to me, I've given you $5 million. I heard his voice say that. So I said, okay, I accept that. Amen. So that's about what it's going to cost probably to build this building. So he told me, I've given you $5 million. And I accept it. Amen. We moved on this property. We bought this property for $2.1 million. Amen. God said, I've given you $2 million. And within, within, within five years, it's 100% paid off. Amen. And, and, and over that course, I can't point to one person who get, you saw, you must have millionaires giving you money. No, it never, it never was huge amounts. It was just everybody given as they were led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, uh, and God, God did it. God said he would do it, and he did it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. In, uh, in, in the Bible, in the Bible, God has called us to be sowers. He, that, that, word, that is a word that God used. And that's what God called a giver. And I'm going to read to you from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And uh, for some odd reason, I, don't have, I think it's verse 6. But anyway, I'm going to read from the, the Living Bible. It says this. He said, but rem remember this. If you give little, you get little. A farmer who plants just a few seeds will get only a small crop. But if he plants much, he will reap much. Amen. The, I've got another translation. It's called the LITV. I don't think we've got that one, but it's the literal translation. And it says, it says this, and, and this, the one sowing sparingly, in other words, it's a lifestyle, will also reap sparingly. And the one sowing on hope of blessings will also reap on blessings. Now, I have something here I want to read that comes right out of a commentary that I don't usually do that, but I just want to do that for just a moment. As we're, talking about, as we're talking about giving, we're talking about sowing. And he says this, he who, he, he's talking about this verse, this commentary talking about this very verse. He said, who keeps sowing sparingly, sparingly shall he also reap. And who keeps sowing on the basis of the blessing, on the basis of the blessing shall he also reap. So God, through Jesus, redeemed us from the curse of poverty. And he gave us, the Bible says, Galatians 3, chapter 3, verse 14, he gave us the same blessing that he gave Abraham. Amen. So the way we activate and walk in that blessing, according to this verse, is by sowing. Because every provision that Jesus made demands an action of faith to receive it. Faith is not a thought. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is an action. It's like love. Faith and love are, 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 are like twins, spiritual twins. Love comes out of the heart. Faith comes out of the heart. If I say I love you, those are words. But if there's no action, then those words are meaningless. They're empty. They're powerless. Amen. Faith is the same thing. You can say what you believe. You can have a great confession. And we believe in confession. But if there's no action, corresponding action, to that confession, then, then it's, it's dead. It's meaningless. The Bible said faith without works is dead. Amen? So what is, what is the action of my faith in the blessing of the Lord? It's, my, it's the act of my giving. Amen? It's the act of my giving. So, so I, I want to skip down here. He, he says this. Are you with me? Amen. He who keeps sowing, he says, this is Paul's picture of the Christian giver. And he says, the sower is, is the exact designation which Jesus used in the wonderful parable in Matthew 13. He called him the sower. Matthew 13, 3, put that up there. Matthew 13, 3. He says, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. A sower went out to sow. By the way in which you sow, God lets you yourself in advance let you yourself say in advance in what way 
what kind of harvest and how much you want to reap. Sow sparingly, a few grains, you, you will reap sparingly. You certainly don't expect a few grains to produce barnfuls, right? But the business that God's called us to, behold, the sower went out to sow. That was purpose. He went out to sow. That was purpose. He decided ahead of time the harvest. The harvest isn't, isn't determined by prayer. The harvest isn't determined by what you desire. The harvest isn't determined even by the vision you may have. The harvest is determined by the, by, by the sowing that you do. Amen? That's an eternal principle in the Bible. God has never left any of us confined or constrained under, under, under poverty that we can never break out of. Even if we start with, even if we start where we are and we sow a dollar, that's all we have is a dollar. Well, you should sow it. Because if you don't sow it, nothing's going to, there's no harvest. Amen. But because the law of the kingdom is increase, increase, I want to give more. I want to give more. So I, I, I've graduated from the, do, from the dollar mark to the $5 mark to the $10 mark to the $100 mark. Amen. Amen. To the $1,000 mark. Hallelujah. And we as a church, many of you already know this, we as a church, we're a giving church. We give more than, we give, we give more than, than a quarter million dollars away every year. I mean, in December, we, gave, we sold, we sold $33,000 to Israel. We took up a special offering. I think it was the biggest offering of the year. Amen. And we gave, it, we gave every dime of it away. Why would you do that, Pastor? I thought you wanted to build a church. That's how you build a church. Hallelujah. That's how you get. Pastor, God said he gave you $5 million. How are you going to get $5 million? We're going to sow. When I'm sowing, I'm exercising power. Power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. I'm, God, <laughs> by His grace, has called me to be a sower. Amen. A sower. I'm a sower. Looking for opportunities to sow. That's my business. That's my business. That's what I do. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, hallelujah. So we sowed, I don't know, a lot more than that, but just this last Israel thing, we sowed $33,000 and, and 700, $33,750. Hallelujah. Amen. So what do you expect out of that, Pastor? I expect a harvest. That's not really the full motivation why I gave. Full motivation why I gave because we love Israel and because we see those Israelis being refugees in their own country because of the bombing at the border. So we sowed out of compassion. But God said giving is sowing. Amen. Sowing is planting a seed. Nobody plants a seed in a, in a flower garden, in a vegetable garden, nobody plants a seed who doesn't expect a harvest. There's an expectation of a harvest. That's not carnal. That's God's way. That's the kingdom way. Amen? Kingdom way. So I'm, I'm expecting, I'm placing a demand on maximum, maximum return. Maximum return. Hallelujah. That 33,000 turns into turns into three million come on turns into five million hallelujah praise the Lord so what you do is you hit your wagon you hit your wagon to this and say God I'm gonna I'm gonna make a priority for your vision for this place and you sow your seed hallelujah and you make your demand you're not making your demand on people you put your demand on heaven and the resources of heaven Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you stand up, please? Man, I just don't think I got the strength to preach till I get up and start preaching. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Father, you have so richly blessed us. We're, we're a blessed people today. And it's all because of your grace. Father, thank you for these people today that are generous givers. Your grace is on their life. Lord, you're blessing their business. You're blessing their employment. You're blessing their, their family. Lord God, you're blessing their job. I, I declare increase. Lord, in 2024, I declare increase. God, I declare the very spirit of El Shaddai, the spirit of more than enough, comes upon every person in this house in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that out of that overflow, we become generous givers, sowers in the kingdom of God. Father, I thank you for testimonies, breakthroughs, miracle, miracle avalanches of finance. Hallelujah. Houses paid off. Cars paid off. Hallelujah. Lord, I, I declare credit cards paid off. I declare that, that debt is absolved. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, I give you praise. Lord, let us give. Let's give to the Lord today. God bless you as you give. the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you're sick today, just, just lay your hand on your body wherever you might be suffering. You can, you're in pain or maybe you've had a condition that's been persisting for years. Just, just lay your hand there right now in the name of Jesus. Just sense an anointing right now. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father, for that for the power of the Holy Spirit, God, that flows. Father, I use the mighty name of Jesus. And I take authority over every sickness, every pain, every spirit of infirmity that's harassing, oppressing the bodies of your people. You foul thing in Jesus' name. I bring you into my authority and I break your power in Jesus' name. And I command you, leave their body. Leave their body now in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Father, by faith, I release the anointing upon their body right now. Father, thank you, Lord. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is flowing here right now. The power of God's touching people. The power of God's touching people. Flowing right through, your, right through your body right now, wherever you are. Pain, go. Pain is leaving you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, beautiful, beautiful Holy Spirit. 
Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, everybody, just lift up both hands to the Lord. We just lift up our hands to the Lord. We lift up our hands to you, Jesus. Mighty Jesus, we lift your, our hands up to you. Lord, we praise your holy name. We magnify your name, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we magnify your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessing and honor and glory, 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 glory. Glory, glory. Now, don't, don't miss this moment. I'm telling you, there's a, there's a healing anointing. There's a healing anointing like a cloud that's settling over this place right now. You're just coming, you just, it's, it's settling down on you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, Lord, right now. Thank you, Lord, right now. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we bless your holy name. We bless your holy name. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. to you last Sunday we'll be talking about biblical strategies for spiritual warfare and uh, we want to we want to do that this morning we want to head in that direction won't finish it today obviously but uh, in the book of in the book of Matthew chapter 7 Jesus gives us something here that's that's important the number one the number one point in the beginning of spiritual warfare is to understand that God's called you personally, individually to live a life that is victorious over everything that is, uh, has beset you, everything that has come against your life so that you begin to live in the victory that Jesus fully and abundantly provided for you. Amen? Uh, so, we focus, first of all, like Jesus, before Jesus ever launched into his, his worldwide, worldwide ministry, healing the sick, casting out devils, preaching the gospel, he first of all faced the devil himself alone in the wilderness and was tempted, he had an appetite. Everybody has appetite, that is, has, has desire. That appetite in itself isn't wrong. The Bible says that when Jesus... After, Jesus, after 40 days, the Bible said Jesus hungered, which means what? He had an appetite for food. And so the temptation came in line with his appetite. The devil wanted him to satisfy that appetite in a wrong way. And if he had not sinned to eat, but if he had satisfied the appetite according to the direction the devil was, was trying to lure him to do, it would have been a sin. And so the devil's always going to, he's going to tempt you in line with whatever appetites you have. And many of those appetites aren't wrong in themselves. God himself created them. But the devil wants you to satisfy those outside of God's plan. So our fleshly appetites have got to be brought into subjection 
to the purpose and the will and the plan of God. And we cannot live our life following the desires and the dictates of our flesh. Amen? I mean, everybody, everybody is tempted. Even Jesus was tempted, but Jesus didn't sin. And so we've got to bring all of that into subjection under, the, under, under authority and live our life according to the Word of God. Because really, when you satisfy those, let's call them fleshly appetites outside of God's plan, while you're satisfying that appetite outside of God's plan, in all reality, you're fellowshipping with an evil spirit. You're not doing that all by yourself. That's what, what, would, what would have happened if Satan came to Jesus and said, Jesus, Jesus is hungry, obviously. Jesus, just turn these, just turn these, 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 these stones to bread. And gee, what if Jesus said, yeah, I'm real hungry, I'm going to do that. So he does that. He's doing that, and he would have been doing that in fellowship with the spirit that was luring him to do that. Isn't that right? Well, that's, that's really, that's really, that's where you really get started in spiritual warfare. You deal with your flesh. You deal with the things the Bible talks about, you know, laying aside every sin that does so easily beset you. Amen? So everybody has that, possibly has that thing that, that they most easily fall prey to. And God wants you to put that under your feet and break its power and you divorce yourself from that so that that thing no longer has a place in your life. That thing no longer has influence in your life and you move past that in strength and you come to a place where that thing never, never gets you again. Amen. By and through the strength, the strength that God has in fact given us. Say amen. Amen. So that's what we do. We do that in the name of God. Of the Lord Jesus. Now, let's look here in chapter 7 and let's begin with verse 1 and then we'll move through this chapter a little bit. Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. With the measure you use, it shall be measured to you back. Now, verse 3. He said, Why? Now, God has called every one of us to be our brother's keeper. Amen. You know, in the garden when, when uh, Cain had had already killed his brother, and God comes to him and said, where's your brother? And he said, well, am I brother's keeper? Well, he was. He was to be. But we are our brother's keeper. We, we love one another, and we have, to, we, have to, we have to minister to one another. Say amen. So God's called us to ministry. But look here what Jesus says. He said, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? So, so before I start... Before I, start, uh, before I start ministering to others, before I start, let's use the word, before I start casting devils at other people, amen, I got to get the devil out of my own life. I got to deal with my own demons. Hello? It's going to be, somebody said, it's going to be awful hard to get somebody else free when you got in you what their guy got in them. Hello? God wants you to, God wants you to, God wants you to practice some self-deliverance. <laughs> Amen. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Do you know what that picture is? That picture is, is uh, that's the picture of, 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 I see a picture of, of a, of a, an eye surgeon, all right, an eye surgeon. Now, now notice how precious, the picture of how precious God puts upon the, va the value that God puts on the people we're called to help. It's, that person is as precious as your eyeball. That person is as precious as, as eyesight. So how am I going to deal with this person? How am I going to minister to this person? I'm going to treat them in the same way that I would treat my eye. Amen? If you had a piece of sawdust in your eye, you wouldn't pull a steak knife out and try to, try to get it out. You'd use something a little softer in consideration of how valuable your eye really is. Isn't that right? But when I read that verse, I get the picture of an eye surgeon. 
You know, an eye surgeon. He's got a scalpel, and he's about ready. He's about ready to operate on your eyeball, except he's half blind. Amen. He's half blind. Well, I don't want that guy operating on my eyeball. Amen. I mean, he's going to cut more. He's going to cut more than my eye. He's not going to do more than get a speck out of my eye. He's going to. He's going to totally. I'm going to leave there blind. But that's the way we've got to look at ministry. You've got, you see, it's in, you know, we had prayer meeting the other night, and it was said, and I agree, it's easy, it's easy to see the faults in other people. Amen? It's easy to come to church and see the faults possibly in the church. But where you need to start is, is you need to start by, you need to start by looking in the mirror and let God through the Holy Ghost help you see the faults that's in your own life and take the power and the provision of God's grace and apply it in that area and get victory in that area. Amen. Did you notice that when Jesus defeated the devil in the wilderness, came out of that time of temptation, when he come out of the wilderness, the Bible says that he walked in a new level of the power of the Spirit. Why? Because he had put the devil under his feet. Amen. Now there are people that are sitting here right now that there are some things in your life and there are people that have been entangled in some things for a long time. And what you don't know is, is that very thing is the reason why you've been defeated in some areas of your life. And you need to look at it very seriously and say, well, listen, this is 2024 and we're not getting any younger. And it's time, it's time to draw a line and say, I'm putting that thing out of my life. Hallelujah. And that's what God has absolutely called us to do. So what are you going to do? First of all, you're going to deal with the speck that's in your... It, it, uh, you're not going to deal with the speck that's in your brother's eye. You're going to deal with the plank that's in your own eye. Amen? And so when we, be, we begin to talk about the army of God, that, that involves everybody. That means that God's called every person in this building into the army of God to be a, to be a, a, a soul winner, to be a minister of health, healing, and deliverance to the people that are oppressed on the outside. Every single person every single person amen and so there has to be periods of your life that's why we fast there's be periods in your life where you just you lay it all out before God and say okay God here I am and I want you to deal with me I want you to deal with me amen you're about to send me out about to send me in front of this church we're about to go out to Walmart and witness to people amen I want you to deal with me I want to be a pure vessel so there's a pure flow that can flow through my life. That's what I'm after. Amen. I mean, you know, I told, I told a preacher recently, I said it takes more than money and a microphone to minister. Amen. Matter of fact, you don't need money to minister. You don't need a microphone to minister. All you need is, all you need is your obedience and the power of the Holy Spirit. You can start with one person. Amen. I mean, we don't need we don't need the screens. We don't need the lights. We don't need the instruments to minister. Amen. Thank God for the screens and thank God for the instruments. We don't need any of that to minister. Amen. The Lord spoke to me one day and said, "Tell me." You know, I was this is some years ago. I was praying. God said to me, "Tell me. Tell me what was John the Baptist's budget." Amen. How much did it cost him to have that crusade? Amen. He wasn't wearing designer shoes. <laughs> Man, some of these guys on TV, they, they love fancy shoes. Amen. Amen. It's, all, it's awesome. Hallelujah. Yeah, but it, you don't need that. And there's some people come along and say, Man, I got to have those shoes. I got to have that jacket. I got to have those screens. I got to have those lights. Amen. If you don't have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, if you don't have a pure flow of the Holy Spirit, all of that is, is, is noise. It's just pure noise. Hallelujah. Amen. You don't, thank God for a great praise team that leads us in worship. Hallelujah. But you don't have to have a great praise team singing behind you for you to minister healing. All you've got to have is faith in the name. Hallelujah. The blood and the word. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You saw that screen right there, that gentleman. That gentleman, you know, Jeanette, I guess, ministered to him. That gentleman, you know, being pain-free and demonstrating, running it. 
Amen. She didn't have a full car. <laughs> you know, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. It takes a pure flow. It takes a pure flow. You got to deal with yourself. And I'm not up here condemning you. I'm here telling you there's grace for you. Whatever it is your sin, whatever it is your struggle, there is grace for you. But you've got to stop running away from it. And you've got to be like Moses. God said to Moses, Moses, take your shoes off. In other words, I want you to get full exposure. Take your shoes off. I want you, I want to get you to get full exposure. I want you to expose yourself to my presence. And I'm going to deal with you. Amen. So we start there. That's where we start. That's where we start. Now, if you, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not checking on nobody. I'm not going walking around. Are you fasting? Are you fasting? Are you fasting? Amen. I, we don't have a pair of scales at the back door weighing everybody. You got to do what we got to do. <laughs> you got to weigh in at the beginning of the fast and weigh in at the end of the fast. Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not doing that. So I don't know if you're fasting or not. So, you know, don't look at me like that. But if you're not fasting, if you've not fasted, you have to ask yourself why. Why? Amen. When it's so clearly in the Bible, and frankly, you know, I'm, I think I'm the shepherd and the sheep ought to follow. <laughs> I don't know. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, so you, have to, you have to ask yourself why. Who's in charge? I'm not, I mean, who's in charge in your life? Amen. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. Amen. Who's in charge? Amen. The flesh will rebel. The flesh will scream. The flesh will say, I can't do it. The flesh will give you a million reasons why you can't do it. But it's just a matter of just saying, I'm going to do it. I set, the Bible said Daniel set himself. Amen. If you are called to ministry in every, any capacity, and, and every one of us are, then you have to put enough value on that ministry in order to, to at least spend some time alone with God in fasting. You have to. When I was in, when I was in traveling ministry, when I was in traveling ministry, there are churches, there are churches that that were that were such character and caliber. I mean, I'm thinking of a church right now. I've never been in the pulpit of that church where I fasted less than three days before I got there. Why? Because of, the, because of the value that I placed on the opportunity. It was the value that I placed on the opportunity. Amen. I get invited. I get, in, I'm get, I get invitations all over the world. And never... You know, I'm going to say never. I, I, I can't say never, but very rarely have I ever, have I ever left this country and stood on a, on a crusade platform where I had not least fasted for three days before I got there. Why? It's because there are people that are going to be there, and this is their last chance. There are people that are going to be there, and this is their last opportunity. And I have to be my best. I have to give my best. Amen. And I, th I think about that. that. Why am I fasting right now? Why am I fasting? Why am I up here preaching? Amen. Amen. I'm in my 15th day. The 15th day of water. I haven't, eat, I haven't eaten anything since Sunday morning two weeks ago. Why am I doing that? It's because of what I see as the potential of what God wants to do right here. Amen. And what I feel in my spirit of the future and where God wants to take this ministry. There's a demand, there's a responsibility on me to be my best so that I can lead you, so that I can teach you, so that I can, by God's grace, impart something real into your life. Amen? I mean, if it's lights and hype, then, I, then, then this is my, I quit. <laughs> I'm not quitting. Amen. Amen. And whoever you are, whatever position your position is, if you're in the, if you're in the, the children's ministry, if you're in street reach, if you're in uh, Lifeline, if you're, if you're on the praise team, 
then there ought to be enough, enough value in your position that at least a meal, at least a day before you're, you know, we alternate. You, you know, most people aren't doing the same ministry every week. At least you're up. You're up. That ought to be so valuable to you, so, so an opportunity to you, that it demands of you personally spending some time fasting and praying before the Lord. Amen. I, I will tell you of myself, I will tell you of myself that if I want to be my best, if I want to be my sharpest, amen, then, then I add fasting, I add fasting to, my, to what I'm about to do. You know, and if you, you know, some of the greatest men of God of our generation and the past generations, and you read their messages, and often, you know, for example, I'll use Brother, I'll use Brother Hagen for an example. You know, Brother Hagen, you know, I never, I never sat directly under his ministry. I read his books, listened to his, his recordings. And, and was blessed, tremendously blessed by his ministry. If you listen to his message, most people think, well, he just taught on faith. That's all he did. He did teach on faith. He had a revelation from God on faith. Amen. His revelation from God opened my eyes on faith. Amen. Hallelujah. It was a great moment in my life. But if you read his life, you read his life, he fasted. He said this. He fasted two 24-hour fasts Two days a week, every day of his life. Amen. And the Lord told him, I read it in his book. The Lord told him, and if the anointing begins to wane, in other words, you're noticing the anointing seems to be, seems to be, you know, seems to be, you know, going down. Amen. What do you mean by wane? Sometimes it's like you had a dimmer switch on the lights. Sometimes, and I, I have felt it in myself, it's like somebody's turning the dimmer switch. People may not notice at the time, but you notice. You notice. Amen. The dimmer switch is going down. I've got to note that in my own heart. Whoa. God said to Brother Hagen, if you see that happening, immediately go on a three-day fast, and the anointing will come back to full, full tide, flood tide. Amen. Amen. So here's the whole way this is supposed to work. Everybody in every position is, is, is monitoring themselves and making sure that they're in flood tide. Hallelujah. And that, that starts with me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And that's what I'm after. Amen. That's what I'm after. Praise God. So we start there. We start there dealing with ourselves. Amen. The Lord even spoke to two things to me. He said to me, he said, what do you, when you're fasting, okay, when you're, when you're fasting, when you're, when you're not eating. He said, what do you think about the most? Now, listen, you know, I know you're laughing because, I, yeah, I'm there, right? But i got to get my mind off of that. Food. <laughs> Amen. You can't fast for a long time and think about food and hang out in the kitchen. Amen. Watch those commercials of those guys eating pizza and pulling that pizza away. That cheese is stringing out. You just can't watch those commercials. Those pictures are like that for a reason. Right? <laughs> Amen. But the Lord said to me, it's a moment of self-discovery. He said, when you're fasting, when you're not eating, He said, what are you thinking about the most? He said, it's a sign, it's a signal of what's most important in your life. It's a moment of self-discovery. Right? So when I find out that my natural bent, my natural flow is to think about that and not, 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 not the things of God, then I realize, wow, I, I got I to adjust something here. I got to come back. Amen? The other thing the Lord spoke to me is, He said, He's talking about love. The other thing the Lord said, talking about love, He said, at least, at least, how much do I love you? Je you know, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? The Lord says, okay, at least you love me more than yourself. At least. Amen. Hallelujah. At least you love me more than you love yourself. So why would you deprive yourself? Because when you're fasting, really fasting, social life is out the window. Can't hang out. I mean, we hang out with people. I love to hang out with people. But when we hang out with people, what do we do? 
we eat. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, how do you hang out with people if you don't eat? Right? So when eating is gone, hanging out with people is, is not easy. Right? It's not easy. Social life is out the window. <laughs> Amen? I mean, married life is, is pretty much out the window. Get up in the morning. I spend most of my day out in my, in my office. It's out the window. Sharon, Sharon I'll say to you, I miss you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was watching a guy on TV talking about fasting. Young man I like to watch sometimes. and He's in the middle of a broadcast. He looked over. His wife was on there with him. Amen. He looked over at his wife. He said, let's go home and eat, drink some broth and spend some time together. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, let's move on. All right. Go, go, on, go on to verse, uh, verse 21. I'm moving slow. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's a reason. No, that's the wrong verse. Sorry. Verse 24. Jesus said, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine... And does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. All right, so Jesus now is talking about what are you going to build your life on? You're going to build your life on the rock. And I think it's Luke says that, that, that the man dug deep. And so it takes some digging to get deep. Amen? He says he built his house on the rock. Now, the next guy, obviously, you know the rest of the story. I, I'm not going to read the rest of that right now. Go to verse 36. Um, he said, anyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them, not just listen to them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So there are two kinds of people, Jesus said. And, and it, would be, it could be said in this congregation. There are two kinds of people here. Walk outside, there are two kinds of people. There are people that are actually building their, their life, they're building their life on a rock, or they're building their life on the sand. Amen? Now, what is the rock? The rock is the revelation of the Word of God. More specifically, it's the revelation of Jesus that's found in the Word of God. Jesus said, upon this rock... I will build my church. And what was the rock? The rock was, G Jesus said, who do, who do people say that I am? And they said, a list of people. He said, Peter, who do you say I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was a revelation. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So the rock is the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ that's revealed to us in the Bible. So upon what am I going to build my life? I'm going to build my life. Listen, I'm going to stake my life on the revelation of Jesus that comes to me out of the Word of God. That's where I'm going to build my life. I'm going to search the Scripture. I'm going to meditate in the Scripture in those things specifically that reveal to me the person and the work of Jesus in His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to heaven. And when I discover those truths, I'm going to believe that, and I'm going to build my life on that. Amen. Because Jesus said, in your life, in this world, in this world, you're going to have what? Tribulation. So the tribulation doesn't come from heaven. The tribulation doesn't come from God to the, from the Father. Tribulation comes out of the world. It comes out of the cursed system that came into existence on this planet when Adam sinned. God is not sending that stuff into your life. He's not even allowing that stuff into your life. The fact that you live on this planet, that stuff is in the world already. You live in a cursed and a fallen world. Amen. So don't go down the line of that theology that said God allowed that or God sent that because he had a bigger purpose. That is philosophy. That is philosophy. And philosophy is not, is not found in the Bible. Matter of fact, Paul warned us of philosophers. I preached about that last Sunday. Amen. 
So what am I going to build my life on? I'm going to build my life on the revelation of Jesus in the Word. Amen. Then what happens to the guy that built his life on the revelation of Jesus in the Word? He had a life without any, any storms. Amen. Everything was always smooth sailing. Nothing ever, ever turned upside. Nothing ever went wrong in his life. That's not what the Bible says. Amen. He's in this world and in this world. How many of you know that, let me say it like this, adverse weather patterns didn't exist in the planet before Adam sinned. Adverse weather patterns came into existence with Adam's sin. And as part of the old fallen order, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes are not, are not works of God. Amen. The Bible said, now what happens in this guy's life, okay? He, man, he, he digs in the Word. He gets deep in the Word. He, builds, he, has, he sees the revelation of Jesus in the Word, and he builds his life on that revelation. And the Bible said the rains descended. Oh, no, the rain descended, the floods rose, the winds blew and beat on that house. So the storm came. The storm came, right? So how is he going to defeat the storm in his life? He defeated the storm by what he decided to discipline himself to do before the storm ever came. Amen. My decision, my decision not to pray my decision not to spend time in the Word, my decision not to fast, is my decision to be defeated. That's predetermined before I ever get to the battle. What Ephesians chapter 6 calls the day of evil, that you may be able to stand in the day of evil. Bef long before that, I've already made some choices. I've already made some choices that are going to guarantee that I'm going to win when this storm comes. Amen? Amen. I've already made choices over here, and that is I've spent time focusing on the Lord. You and I get up in the morning. You get up in the morning. You have devotions. You have devotions. Listen to me. You can't just come to church on Sunday and expect some man or woman of God to cast it out. Oh, pastor, can you cast this out? Yes, we can cast it out. But you're going to have to make some decisions. You're going to have to make some choices. Because you're going to have to live your life in a fallen world. And you've got to know that storms are going to come. Storms are going to blow in. So you better, you better be diligent on this side and discipline and start digging. You better take this, this, this Jesus thing a little more serious in your life. It's a matter of life and death. I tell you, it's a matter of heaven and hell. It's a matter of losing or, or winning. Hallelujah. Make a winning decision and decide, I'm going to spend some time digging deep in the Word of God and get my life founded on the rock, Christ Jesus, in every area. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So he builds his house on a rock. Here's the other guy. He, hears, he heard the same teaching. He heard the same teaching. He said, not, but everyone who hears these, hear, well, back to the guy, the, the rain came and he, and he survived. He won, right. But everyone that hears these things of mine and does not do them. He didn't say you heard them and said amen. And does not do them. Practice them. This became a practice in my life and do them, he is a foolish man because he's building his house on the sand. And so what happened? Same storm. Rain descended, floods came, winds blew, and beat on that house, and the Bible said, and it fell, and great was his fall. Right? Right. So what do you got to do? You got you to get yourself a Bible. You got to get yourself a Bible. Amen. And you got to focus in on the revelation of Jesus contained in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. And you got it, you got it, you got it, you got to, you know, you got to get you some good teaching on Jesus. The revelation of Jesus, the finished work of Christ, redemption in the Bible, and you got to build your life on that. Amen. Because a storm is coming. And in the middle of a storm, 
in the middle of a storm, there may be fog. And sometimes they call it the fog of war, where, where, where the storm has set in on you, and you don't know up from down, left from right, and the panic is going to kick in. The panic is going to kick in. And most decisions made at that moment are made based on pure fear. 99.9% of the decisions made at that time are going to take you toward death, are going to take you toward, I'm going to take you in the wrong direction. Hello, say amen. Amen. So there's that, that fog is going to set in. I mean, the rain is falling, the floods are rising, the wind is blowing, and, the, and you know, maybe even the house is shaking. And in that moment, you've got to know who you are. You've got to know what Jesus said. You've got to stay planted. You've got to stay planted on the revelation of the Word of God in that moment and not be moved with your emotions. Amen. Not be moved with your emotions, but in that hour to be moved by faith in what you know that God spoke to you in the secret time in His presence out of the Bible. Hallelujah. Say amen. Amen. Now, I know time. Col- turn with me to Colossians. Turn with me to Colossians. Man, these, 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 these are Pauline epistles. You know, some churches, if you actually preach the Pauline revelation, they kick you out as a her- heretic. Amen. Well, that proves they don't read the Bible. Huh. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to give you three things right here. It's part of that rock upon which, which we build our life. Okay. And it's in, it, it, may be, it may be more than three, but it's a few. All right. Verse, uh, verse 13. The, Paul says, and you being in the past in your life, you, and you being dead in your trespasses. That's their past. That's before that's B.C., before Christ. And, and you... Being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. In other words, the moment Jesus rose from the dead, when Jesus rose from the dead, in that very moment, God, through Jesus, made me alive. I came, I came to life. Amen. So now, in my current condition, my past condition, I was dead. In my current condition, I'm alive with a new kind of life. Amen. What kind of life is that? That is the same life that brought Jesus up from the dead. That same life is in me now. And that same life has made me a new creation. I'm alive with the life of God. I'm alive with the life of God. You cannot tell me that I am simply a mere human being. You cannot tell me that I'm simply a mere human being and therefore subject to all the, all the mistakes and sins of every other human being because that's not who I am anymore. Who am I now? I am a new creation filled with a new kind of life. And the life that I now have is a life that came straight out of heaven. And that has made us new creations. That has made us sons of God. Sons of God. You say, but I'm a woman. It doesn't matter. You're a son of God. Amen. Neither male nor female, Paul said. You have the, in the kingdom of God, as a female, you have the position of a son. I can take you to Galatians and prove that to you. I don't have time. Amen. You may be a female, but you have sonship authority. That don't mean you have authority over your husband. <laughs> Amen. Let's get this right. Amen. It means you've got authority over demons. Uh, all right. All right. He made me alive together with him. Now, now stop right there. There are, there are three things here that took place that, that, that are necessary for that to be true. Three things that are necessary for that to be true. And if any of these three things are not true, 
then that's not true. Right? He made me alive together with Him. I love that. He made me alive together with Him. It's like the Holy Spirit is looking at me, looking at you, and saying, He made you. I made you alive together with Him. And He points at Jesus. Jesus is standing there. Holy Spirit is talking to you and saying, I made you alive together with Him. And there Him is standing and His eyes are like fire. And his face is shining brighter than the sun. And his, his whole body is radiant with the glory of God. Fresh out of the tomb. Alive. Radiant life. And he looks at you and said, I made you alive together with him. <laughs> Hallelujah. But here is the basis of that. Having, one, this is the first one, having forgiven you, A-L-L, all trespasses. Listen, you have to come to the, to the, to the belief that all of your sins are forgiven you. Not just the little ones, not just the big ones, but all of your sins are forgiven you. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, be of good cheer. Or, another translation, have courage because your sins are forgiven you. Yeah, that bed has held you for years. You've been imprisoned in that paralysis. You've been imprisoned on that bed, unable to walk, dependent on everybody else. But I'm telling you, be of good courage. You're about to do something that you cannot do. Be of good courage. Why? Because all of your sins are forgiven you. So the bed can't hold you no more. The paralysis, it can't stay anymore. Hallelujah. I'm about to tell you to take up that bed. I'm about to tell you to take up that bed and walk. But why? Why should he have courage? His sins are forgiven him. All. A-L-L. Everybody say all. Say all. Say all my sins are forgiven me. Say I am completely and totally forgiven say there is nothing against me before God say I am free say I am clean say I am washed say I am forgiven shout hallelujah hallelujah amen that is a peace that's a part of the rock that we build our life on the wind is going to blow. The rain is going to fall. The, the flood is going to rise. And in that hour, you're going to look yourself in the mirror and say, what did I do wrong? There must be some sin in my life. No, you're going to stand there and look at yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, I am forgiven of all of my sins. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And this storm is going to pass and I'm going to stand in the glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So I, you, if I have the consciousness, if I have the consciousness of being forgiven, that in itself gives me dominion. That in itself gives me authority. That in itself makes me look at the storm. Hallelujah. So I ain't turning it back. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, one of the things we learned in prophetic school with, with, with uh, Prophetess of Ruth is that there are dreams that what she called impartation dreams. They don't necessarily need to be interpreted. It's a dream God's showing impartation into your life. It was interesting. I, I, I agree with that. I never heard that before. She taught on that in, uh, when was that? November, right? And, uh, but anyway, I had a dream well, less than a year ago. In the dream, I come, out, I come out of a building. I come out of this building. I look back over top of the building, back the other way, and the sky was just dark with storm. And, uh, and it, looked, it looked horrible. And so I, I spoke to my wife, and I asked her, come out of the house. Savannah was there as well. I said, hey, come outside and look at this. And so Pastor Sherry 
our daughter Savannah came out of the house and before they got to where I was I saw a huge funnel tornado funnel drop out of the clouds and start coming our way and I said let's we got to run and they were there with me and we turned and started running and I, I kind of I let them go ahead of me and I stood between me and the storm they were going ahead of me but then I realized we, we, we can't run fast enough there's no way we, we can't make it amen and I turned to face the tornado and I heard in the dream I heard in my spirit use your authority use your authority and so when I heard that, I faced the storm like I was Superman. Hallelujah. And I looked it right in the, as you said, the teeth. And I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I stood there and said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, even in the dream, the thought is, if you keep standing here, you're going to die. But something inside of me said, no, I'm, I'm not backing down a step. Hallelujah. And that tornado just dissipated. And it was gone. Hallelujah. So you're not backing down from the storm, whatever, whatever form that storm is. Sickness, financial. You're not backing up. You're not backing down. I know my sins are forgiven me. I know who I am. I know who I am. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Problem with I don't have strength to fast. I don't have strength to preach, and then I start preaching and I can't quit. Give me, give me, give me a minute here. All right, all right. So number one. Number one. Being alive, being alive, having the fullness of the life of God is dependent. Upon me knowing that all of my sins are forgiven me. If you carry a sense of unworthiness, you carry a sense of consciousness of your sin, you're not going to walk in the fullness of that life. Okay, that's not all. Read on. Verse 40, 14 having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he having taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, we can look at other translations of that and, and try, to, try to, I've spent a lot of time on that verse trying to see exactly what God's talking about there. But obviously he's talking about the handwriting of requirements. He's talking about the law itself and the decrees that came out of that law but those decrees, those decrees that come out of that law are like debts that you owe. It's kind of like if you went to the store and you could borrow, you had an account there and you could borrow, borrow to buy certain supplies. And then there would be a note that would be signed and say, okay, you owe $100 or oh, you owe, you owe $1,000. Okay, so those are notes that are against you. There's the stuff that you, that you owe. That's kind of the picture that's giving us there. But the Bible says that when Jesus was nailed to the cross, it was more than Him nailed there. The Bible says that God took all of those notes. He took all of those notes. And God nailed those to the cross. Hallelujah. He nailed those to the cross. So that every debt was paid in full. You could even say, listen, because he's talking about handwriting horses, he's talking about the, the, the law being, being even nailed there. Those decrees could even be called curses. Curses. That God, just saying the same exact way that he took all of my sins, he took all of my sicknesses, he also took every curse. Because every curse would work out from broken, the broken law. The curse of the law, the Bible says. Every curse that was ever, ever spoken over your life, every curse that ever could or would ever come upon your life, God foresaw every one of those. 
And he took those and he did what? He nailed them to the cross. He nailed them to the cross. Hallelujah. <laughs> and when he nailed them to the cross, I'm here to tell you that he took every bit of energy out of them. He took every bit of bite out of it. He took every bit of force out of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let's go back to our parable. Here, here, is a, here is a man. Here is a man that didn't dig deep. Here is a man that didn't build his house on the rock. And the storm came and he fell. He built his house on the sand, right? And let's just suppose, just for illustration, just suppose for, for illustration that that was, this is, that was your daddy. Right, I know you have a good daddy, so I'm not talking about you. But let's just suppose that was your daddy, right? So next generation, here you are. Here you are. But you have dug deep and you have built your house on the rock and on that rock you know that you have new life and on that rock you know that all of your sins are forgiven you and you know you know that the handwriting of ordinances and every decree that came out of them was nailed to that cross hallelujah but the same storm that came into your daddy's life over here is now coming into your life a generation later you are not condemned to fail in the same way your previous generation failed hallelujah hallelujah I said hallelujah hallelujah that thing that thing was broken you say but how was it broken it was broken by the finished work of Jesus Christ and I build my life upon that solid rock hallelujah 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 Listen, your daddy might have been a, been a drug addict. Your daddy might have been a drunkard. Your daddy might have been a liar. Your daddy might have been a fornicator. Your daddy might have been in poverty. But I'm telling you that over here, you've built your life on something else. You've built your life on the rock Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And none of that stuff is going to pass to you in your generation. Hallelujah. You're going to walk in power. You're going to walk in victory. You're going to see the fullness of the provision of Jesus fulfilled in your holy life. Hallelujah. 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 I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. Forget it. Forgive me, Lord. Lord, forgive me for saying that because I'm not. It's a lie. I repent of lying. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, ne next thing. Next thing. Notice, now I want you to see something, all right? I'm reading New King James. Hope you've got New King up, James up there. Okay? He says, He made us alive together with Him, having forgiven all our sins. Verse, uh, verse 13. Verse 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. All right? Verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers. So he made us alive, having forgiven all our trespasses, having nailed everything on the cross, the handwriting of ordinances, having, number three, having disarmed. Having what? Disarmed principalities and powers. All right? So me being, being in the fullness of this resurrection life is dependent on three things. Having forgiven all my trespasses, having nailed every handwriting of ordinance that was against me on the cross, and having disarmed principalities and powers. Hallelujah. If I put a question mark beside any of those three, then I'm putting a question mark on myself and the fullness of His life functioning in me. Matter of fact, when you adopt any of those, then that, you'll, that, that life, you'll notice, it's like the dimmer switch. You'll go, you go, you go, you go dull. You'll go dim. When I, when I fully embrace the finished work of Jesus, the rock, the rock, the rock, I don't care about the storm. Don't describe to me your storm. I don't care. It doesn't matter what form the storm takes on. It has to do with the rock. I build my life on the rock, the revelation of Jesus. 
the revelation of Jesus. Now here I am. I've, 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 built, I've dug deep. I'm my, life, my feet are on the rock. I've built my life on the rock. And the storm comes. It's, I mean, I can't, you, can't see, you can't see the, 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 the fog and the, and the wind and the rain and the flood. In that moment, it looks like, it feels like, principalities and powers are not disarmed. And in that moment, you're going to have to make a decision. It's not based on anything you see, hear, or feel. You're going to have to make your decision whether they have power in your life or not. You're not killing me. Why not? Because you don't have power over my destiny. Amen. You're not killing me. Amen. He did what? He disarmed them. Spoiled them, old King James. Spoiled. He disarmed them. He disarmed them. Or another translation said he dethroned them. Or we could take Hebrews 2, 14, put it in there. He destroyed them. Meaning what? Reduced them to zero. It's an accounting's word, Hebrews 2, 14. It's like you have a bank account. You spend all the money. It comes down to zero. And when it comes to zero, how much buying power do you actually have? Zero. That's exactly what the Bible says. Amen. Amen. So when the storm comes, I am fighting a defeated foe. So is predestined already the outcome? Hello. He is disarmed. It's not going to work. He is dethroned. He has no authority. He is destroyed. He is zero. Hallelujah. I don't, I don't feel that. I know that. And I have to know that in the middle of my storm. He has no power. <laughs> he has no power. He has no power. Pastor, he's got power. I feel it. See, you, 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 your house is built on the sand. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Had a friend of mine doing a crusade in West Africa. He was in Ghana, West Africa, just outside of Accra. And he, he invited me to go. He said, he said to me, he said, I'm going to preach. Give an altar call for something. He said, then I want you to pray for the sick. So I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll come. So I went. Long story short, I don't know who it is. It's supposed to be some, some, it's supposed to be some powerful uh, witch doctor in that area. He sent word to the senior pastor and told the senior pastor, he said, I'm coming to that crusade. He said, I want to find out if you, have, you people have any power. Well, good. He's a sinner and he's Jesus. He's welcome. Amen. I heard T.L. Osborne say, so we go to them foreign countries and we would invite every witch, every, every, every warlock, Every voodoo high priest, we invite them all, come. He said, now just stand up and brag on Jesus and see what Jesus will do. Hallelujah. Well, I don't know if he came or not. I hope he did. Hallelujah. Because if he was there, I didn't know it. Why would I care if zero shows up? <laughs> Amen. He said, but he's demon possessed. I'm a Holy Ghost possessed. Hallelujah. <laughs> I preached on that one time. I am possessed with the Holy Ghost. And some, I, I started to lead a crowd to confess that, and one lady refused to confess it. You know, she was possessed with something else. <laughs> yeah, we're full of the Holy Ghost. 
what he is in the demonic realm. I am in the kingdom realm. Hey, hallelujah. He's serious about his stuff. I'm serious about my stuff. But my stuff is way superior than his stuff. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So there you are. There you are in the middle of a storm. The rain is falling. The wind is blowing. The floods are rising. And in that moment, all you hear is the roar of the lion. And it feels like, it feels like some of that stuff's not true, but you're founded on the rock. I don't care what I see. I don't care how I feel. What matters to me is what God said. And what my Jesus, what my Jesus accomplished in his death and his burial and his resurrection. Hallelujah. And if I die, I'll die right here fighting. But I'm not going to die. Hallelujah. Everybody say, I'm not going to die. Hallelujah. You has he made alive. You know what that does? It gives you a new kind of life. It makes you a superman. It makes you a superwoman. You're a superman. Hallelujah. It's a wonder we can't fly. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm about, to, I'm about to jump off here in a minute. Praise God. Glory to God. I think I'm growing wings. I feel it. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, stand up on your feet right now. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Raise up both hands to heaven. Both, raise up both hands to heaven. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. 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 Lord God, as I thank you right now in the name of Jesus, that you empower us, you strengthen us. Lord, I thank you for that. We build our life on the rock, Christ Jesus, and the revelation of Jesus and his word, the revelation of redemption, the revelation of the finished work of Christ. We build our life on that, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today and you're not for certain if you die today, you go to heaven. You're, if you're not for certain if you die today, you go to heaven. I want you to just put your hand up very quickly. Put it up and put it down. I want to pray for you today. You're here right now. You don't know Christ as your Savior. You've walked with the Lord. And you've gone back from following Him. You know you need to make a recommitment to Christ. Raise your hand up right now. Put it back down. In Jesus' mighty name. Do it right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You're here today and you want or need special prayer in any area of your life, raise up your hand right now. In Jesus' name, there's a hand, there's two hands. Yeah, there's another hand. Come on, lift up your hand right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Whatever your need is, just lift up your hand. Lift up your hand in the name of Jesus. Every person here that wants special prayer, step out of your seat, come quickly to the front, and I'll come and pray for you. Uh, our prayer team will be here to join with me in praying for you, but just come on in the name of Jesus. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.